Hello, this is Discovering Your Superpowers, Understanding Cloud Application Models. I'd like to thank my good friends at Plain Concepts for bringing me back this year, as well as our other sponsors. I'm Ryan Nowak. I've spent most of my career at Microsoft working on programming technologies like ASP.NET Core, MVC, and Blazor. I recently made a move to Azure Incubations, where I work on strategic innovation for Azure as a platform. So first of all, what is an application model? That's probably a new term for a lot of people. Uh, secondly, how can you think systematically about cloud runtimes and development environments? And hopefully by the, in, by the end, you can understand runtime environments to easily and more expertly design applications. So before we dig in, why does this matter? Well, we need to learn new technologies all the time. The cloud technologies we use to host applications are no different. They go through periods of change and innovation. My journey in 2020 took me to a different part of Microsoft as a company. Uh, for some reason, I decided that while quarantined was the best time to interview and take on new challenges. Uh, so my expertise in this area comes from a few years of working to support microservices developers using ASP.NET Core and learning from them about all the things that they find difficult. Developers are smart people, and there's a good chance that you feel like you understand your code really well. But how well do you understand the systems that run your code? I found that when talking to developers, almost everything except for your code is hard to get right. And my new role is about raising levels of abstraction for cloud applications to become more developer friendly. So let's introduce the application model as a framework. This is my personal definition, chosen because it's useful. An application model describes the interface between software components and a runtime environment. You can alternatively think of an application model as whatever configuration data is understood by the thing you're deploying to. So let's unpack that a little bit with some examples. Software components are whatever you provide, the software that you write. The interface is the contract used to perform some task. For example, you could use networking as the interface to communicate between services. You could use a file to store configuration data. And the runtime environment is the stack that you're deploying to. When I talk to developers about these topics, they find deployment most frustrating because it's where you go from it works on my machine to not working on someone else's machine. My theory about this is that we habitually get something working as quickly as possible and then think about deployment as the last step only after we're happy with how it works. We're let down when we go to deploy and the concepts we use when we think about the application don't match what's offered by the runtime. To me, it's a classic impedance mismatch problem. We think about what we want to do in one day, in one way, but the system requires a different kind of thinking. In English, we have this lovely term called yak shaving. Uh, it basically refers to solving a series of small problems to accomplish a big task. Without a framework to think about putting an application in production, you cannot predict the set of small problems you'll have to solve to get it working. So to solve this, let's be systematic. We'll do three steps. Think about the needs of the application, understand the options that the deployment environment provides, and then map those needs to the best options. Since we're talking about cloud and microservices, I'm gonna use the term application to refer to a whole software system and service to refer to each unit that makes it up. Let's start very basic, deployment. I need the application to actually start. All the files and dependencies need to be in place. Secondly, I need to be able to communicate to do something useful. If this is a website, I need to be able to accept web traffic. I also might need to talk to other services and databases. I might need some credentials so that I can talk to them. And you can also think about connections in and connections out a little bit differently. For a connection in, you need to have an address. Other people need to be able to find you. This is most commonly going to be a port and a host name for HTTP. For an outgoing connection, you need to know the address. How do you reach the other service? You might also need a password or certificate or a token or some other kind of credentials to communicate with it. Next, what about configuration? We'll want to make some of our application's behaviors configurable. It also might be a good way to communicate things like what addresses or credentials we're using to talk to other services. And lastly, diagnostics. We need some kind of logging. That way we can diagnose problems with a running app or be able to collect data about what kinds of failures occur. 
The app we're going to be using first as an example looks like this. We'll very, really quickly run through what it needs. So what needs to be deployed? These will be simple ASP.NET Core 3.1 applications, so we don't really need anything special for deployment. Just the files produced by a publish, and we need ASP.NET Core available in the runtime environment that we're deploying to. Uh, since it's just going to be my developer machine, that'll be easy. We need the ability to serve web traffic from both of them. So you can think of the front end as serving public traffic and the back end as only serving internal traffic. Uh, with the framework that we just discussed, it means that each service needs to be assigned an address that's reachable. The front end service also needs to know the back end service's address so that they can communicate. And we'll make all of these settings go through uh, configuration for flexibility. And for diagnostics, we're using logging. We need that to appear somewhere that we can see. So let's map these concerns to our code and tools and then understand how these four concepts work. Deployment, communication, configuration, and diagnostics. For deployment, we have to look no further than .NET Publish. Uh, if you can compare and contrast .NET Publish and .NET Run, Run runs your application in place using files and dependencies, NuGet packages that were downloaded to your machine and the local files from your application. Publish will give you a runnable output that you can take to another machine, um, assuming that that other machine has .NET installed. Now, if you want .NET Publish to work on a machine that doesn't have .NET installed, you can do that too. You could say .NET Publish and then say Runtime and put in a Runtime identifier here. Like I could say Linux x64. And this is how I would get a Publish output that includes the .NET runtime for Linux x64. I could have one self-contained folder. I could zip this up, take it to a Linux machine with nothing installed, and everything would be fine. Instead, if I wanted to, I could target Mac or Windows or whatever you want. As long as it's got a runtime identifier, you can do that. It doesn't matter what computer you're publishing from. So something to think about with deployment is, we mentioned before, you know, you have to have .NET in the environment. You can also choose to bring it with you if you're going to run in an environment where .NET's not present. Or if you want to maintain the copy of .NET with your application's bits, you can do that as well. Next, let's talk about incoming HTTP. We need the application to listen. This functionality is part of ASP.NET Core, and ASP.NET Core will do all the heavy lifting for you to interface with the operating system and open up a port. I'll start by running this backend application. And remember, our end goal is to get these two applications to interface with each other and communicate with each other. So when I run this, it's going to choose port 5000 and 5001, which are the default listening ports that go in this launch settings file that's generated by the template. So by default, if you create a new project, you're going to have a launch settings file like this, and it's going to have port 5000 and 5001 hard-coded in it. And if you're running at the command line, if you're running outside of Visual Studio or you're on a Mac like I am, um, that's going to be what you get by default when you run the application with .NET Run. But the problem with that is that every generated application is all referencing the same ports. And as we know, port conflicts are kind of a pain. So what are some other options for how we can configure this? Well, we can do it at the command line. So I can say .NET run, and I can use a command line argument, dash dash URLs, and I have to specify a whole URL here. Uh, it can be multiple URLs, by the way, separated by semicolon. Um, but I have to specify the whole URL here, not just the, not just the port. And I can say .NET run URLs, and then I'm listening on localhost 5005. Let's check it, make sure it works. Looks like it works. And by the way, this is just outputting some really simple JSON about who I am and what machine I'm running on. Cool. So I can do that. Another thing I could do is I could use an environment variable. Now, if you're not a, not a POSIX kind of person, um, this is just a simple way to set an environment variable when you're, when you're launching a process. So my shell will set this environment variable for the process. If you're on Windows on PowerShell or something, just set the environment variable and then launch the process and you'll be good to go. I can say .NET run and it should do the same thing. So we should see this also launch and listen on 5005. And these two settings kind of work the same way. So that's pretty cool. I have multiple options for how to configure that. So where does this code live and how would I do this sort of manually? How can I understand how this all fits together? Well, this feature is in program CS. 
So inside of program CS, you probably have something that looks like this, that's a generated file as part of the template, and you probably never really touched it or thought much about what's in here. What's in here is kind of the configuration of the server stuff. So I can use this web builder to say configure Kestrel, which is the server. This takes a Lambda, so I'll just Lambda myself, make a Lambda there. And then on this Lambda are all the options for, or on this argument are all the options for Kestrel. So I can do things here like listen, listen any IP, listen any local host, listen on Unix sockets, and so on. And this is really where you would use code to configure what the server is going to do when it starts up, is inside this configure Kestrel. Um, when you use configuration or command line arcs or environment variables to configure the server, it all boils down to these API, API calls at the end of the day. Now, I don't really recommend using code to configure this except in special cases where you really have to know what you're doing. Um, and if you find yourself in that situation, you'll probably figure out that you are. Um, since we have two applications here that we need to run together, I've got to do something about this. And since we're just launching them as processes at the command line, probably the simplest thing to do is just update this configuration file. So I'll use 5003 and 5002 yet uh, to figure that out. Now I'm not going to run the front end application yet because we're not quite ready for that. There's some other stuff we need to figure out. We've successfully avoided the port conflict, but since we chose port 5000 for the back end, we need to make sure that the front end application can get that information, that it knows um, what address to talk to the back end on because right now we haven't provided any sort of way to do that. Now, uh, it'd be awfully convenient if we could use the configuration system to flow that data in because it might be different in different places where we run the application. And ASP.NET provides some opinions about configuration. The configuration system can gather and compose configuration data from different formats. So you can get, you get some configuration files on, di on disk as part of the template. That's this appsettings.json and appsettings.development.json. Uh, you also get the command line and environment variable providers for config by default. So when we looked at how to configure the listening port, using the URL's command line argument and environment variable are actually the same thing. They actually go through the same system. Command line argument versus environment variable are just two ways of doing the same thing. So the code that we need to fix or the problem that we need to solve here is that this code here in startup, this is where the front end is going to talk to the back end. We have to be able to get a URL that we can use uh, to talk to it so that we can use this HTTP client to communicate with it. Now, if I really wanted to, I could hard code this. I could say HTTP localhost 5000. And this would be a really great way to make my application not very flexible um, because that value is now a hard coded value. I have to rebuild the code and reship the code. If that value is different anywhere I want, that clearly doesn't scale. We all know to avoid that. But what should we do instead? Well, I'm going to make a little, I'm going to make a call to configuration instead. And I've already got the configuration object available here as a property on my startup class. So I'll say configuration and index into the configuration. Now you can come up with whatever scheme you want for how to use configuration and how to organize configuration keys. I'm doing a very simple thing here, which is saying I'm going to have a node called services and then a key inside of it. Uh, called backend. And your configuration in ASP.NET Core is hierarchical. So if you're mapping this to a JSON file, which I'm about to do, let me show you what that would look like. So we have services, and then inside of that we have backend, and then we have to set this to the value. So because we're just running this on my dev box, we know it's going to be localhost because it's my machine. And we know it's going to be port 5000 because that's the port we chose. So we're giving this URL HTTP localhost 5000. And then that's going to be read from configuration. This colon is a separator, which means nesting. And that's going to create a URL and hopefully be used successfully with our HTTP client. So let's give it a try. And I'll go ahead and start my backend application first. And these should not have a conflict because I updated the configuration file of the front end. So there we go. So we successfully got that URL and we successfully listened on 5000 and 5003. So let's give it a try and see that shake out. Cool.
So it worked. So my front end application was able to get its address and its information, and then it was able to call through to the back end and get its information as well over HTTP. So I successfully avoided a port conflict with these two things, successfully configured them to talk to each other. Now I could also do the same thing with an environment variable or command line argument to feed this into configuration if I wanted to. And there are, good, there are cases that are good for all of these options. Uh, command line and environment variables are usually discussed together because they have similar trade-offs. Environment variables are a little bit easier to compose because they're a set of key values, whereas command line arguments are the same thing, or a single thing. So I tend to kind of avoid command line arguments um, just because I find environment variables a little bit easy to use. Configuration files are better when you have highly structured data like JSON that you want to source control by the application. So it's a good choice for data that you don't want to hard code that can't be reduced to a single set of key value pairs or would be messy to do that. Um, and you don't mind having it in source control. It's not secret or private to your setup. Uh, additionally, configuration files can change. So ASP.NET uh, knows to watch the configuration files and will watch them for changes to things like the logging verbosity. So I could go into, for instance, while this app is running, um, I could go into here and I could set the I could set the Microsoft level to debug. Save that. And then let's go ahead and hit this again and you should see a ton of spam fly by. So I hit that again and you can see there's a ton of spam flying by. So you can write code that is aware of changes to configuration files if that's something you need. So environment variables on the other hand are good for information that you don't want to source control. So that would be information like secrets or deployment specific configuration. Um, environment variables can be clumsy when your data is highly structured because they're just key value pairs. And they also don't change over the lifetime of the app. So they would stay the same the whole time the application is running. We don't really provide you a way to observe changes in environment variables. So let's try this again and we'll just show the same thing for thoroughness with an environment variable because it is a, it's a little bit weird the first time you see it. So my environment variable here would be like services double underscore backend equals HTTP localhost 5000. Now, everyone is surely thinking that I made a mistake and I did not. Um, the double underscore is a kind of a weird thing, but double underscore acts like that separator. And that's the thing that sort of, that's the thing that sort of gives you um, that colon effect or that nesting effect. So you can see we started up here, refresh this, everything's fine, everything's hunky-dory, everything is still really good, cool. So we talked about logging, um, logging and diagnostics. ASP.NET Core will log to the console by default, and for our purposes right now, that seems about right. Um, all these default behaviors, let me show you where they all live, because uh, it's good to know these kind of things. So here in Program SES in the boilerplate area that you've probably not touched before, there's this call to host.createDefaultBuilder. And host.createDefaultBuilder, there's a very long comment here that talks about all of the things that it does. If you want to customize this and you don't want these things to happen, you can change this. You could say, um, I think it, you could just say like new web host or new host. Anyway, new host builder. You can create a new empty host builder and then you can do whatever you want to that host builder and you can replace or customize all of these different kinds of things that are built in by ASP.NET. So if you wanted to have a different set of defaults around logging, a different set of defaults around configuration, you could do that. You could even wrap it up in your own application if you wanted to. It's very, very much a power tool um, and the defaults should work pretty well with most scenarios. So that's all we're planning on doing with this basic application. So let's jump to the next topic. So here's a map of what we learned from this. The top row is the runtime environment, in this case, the process. The middle row is the different concerns that we have to manage. And the bottom row is the different options that we have provided by the runtime. For example, if we want to provide some configuration values, we have three options. However, it's difficult to be productive with raw processes. You have to manually assign and manage the ports, URLs, and file locations of everything. It's definitely doable, but hard to scale. However, we do this all the time. Using processes is the typical thing to do when you're doing local development or debugging. 
This insight is one of the ones that led to the creation of the TIE project. If you're developing cloud or microservices applications, then you really owe it to yourself to check this out. Uh, my colleague Glenn Condren is doing a talk on TIE as part of this event. We really can't talk about processes without also talking about something that I'm calling hosted environments. Hosted environments are a little bit of a special category that is a hybrid. In a hosted environment, you don't get to start a process. Instead, a process starts you. Examples of this would be something like IIS, Azure Web Apps, or Azure Functions. The trade-off here is that the environment is more prescriptive about communication and configuration. As a result, it might be simpler for your use case. You might get a richer SDK to work with compared to something like HTTP. Here's the same diagram, but generalized to hosted environments like IIS or Azure Functions. You don't control the process, so you don't get to use things like environment variables or command line arguments, but the runtime will usually provide its own configuration system as a substitute. If you think about this as something like Azure Functions, it's a much simpler model. You get the ability to bind to all kinds of various inputs built into the host, and there may be fewer details to manage. Things that would be hard to set up on your own are just provided for you in a way that you can directly configure. In general, for cloud servers, there's two ways that they work. There's a proxy-based model and an in-process model. With the proxy approach, you get to run a normal process, and some proxy server will forward traffic to your process. In an in-process model, you're hosted inside a server, like the hosted environment that we just discussed. These models come with different trade-offs. Proxy-based models are optimized for the service to be independent of the cloud runtime. Any language or framework will do. The in-process model is coupled to the server or runtime. You have to use a supported programming technology, but the API can be richer. The application code ends up being responsible for less using the in-process model. However, the in-process model is declining in usage as it's being replaced with more modern technology and being phased out due to the increasingly polyglot nature of our world. Speaking of .NET specifically, Old ASP.NET on .NET Framework uses the in-process hosting model in IIS. This is largely the reason why there had to be an ASP.NET Core in the first place. The libraries for doing web programming in .NET were coupled to IIS and its architecture instead of neutral abstractions. ASP.NET Core, on the other hand, was designed from day one to use a platform-neutral multi-server architecture. It was one of the design goals to give the developer control over the process so that it worked the same in development and production. If you're using ASP.NET Core, you're probably familiar with Kestrel, the cross-platform server, but there's also another one. We have a server implementation that uses HTTP Sys, a Windows kernel driver that has very high usage inside of Microsoft uh, by teams that specifically have a big investment in Windows security and monitoring. How we interface with IIS has changed over time as well. IIS is still popular with .NET Core users, and it's the server used in Azure, Azure Web Apps. We started out using a reverse proxy approach with IIS, but ended up having poor diagnostics, and it was slow. So we now do a bit of a hybrid. ASP.NET Core can plug itself into IIS's hosting APIs, but we don't really expose those concepts to developers, which avoids the need for coupling. This ends up fixing most of the issues we encountered with our earlier attempts. So there were processes and two ways to host server applications, and then for a long time, nothing happened. Enter containers. The idea behind containers has been around for a long time, since the 1970s, in fact. Let's isolate a process so that it can have its own file system and control its access to operating system resources. The modern container arrived in 2006 when control groups were added to the Linux kernel. Linux gained the ability to group processes so that they can share a namespace for control over operating system resources. In addition to the container infrastructure in Linux, container runtimes like Docker layer their own functionality to make containers much easier to use, as well as a management UI and CLI that abstracts over the OS level features. Containers have become ubiquitous since they first entered the mainstream. This is a graphic from the Cloud Native Computing Foundation survey. Keep in mind this is the CNCF audience who are mostly Kubernetes users, so you should expect usage to be high. You'll notice that almost everyone is using containers in dev and test, 
and over the last few years, many, many more people have started using them in production. It would be hard to avoid uh, using or really learning and understanding containers these days. So we won't get extremely technical about how containers work in this talk, but we'll explain some of the benefits and how to leverage them. Okay, and so we're back with the same application, but this time we're going to be running in Docker. And we're going to be talking about how we use Docker or containers to accomplish our four concerns of deployment, communication, configuration, and diagnostics. So we're actually, I've already written Docker files for these, and I've actually already Docker built them. Um, but I'm going to refer to the Docker files last because it's probably the last topic you want to hear about. Um, so Docker build dash T. And the T is the way that you give it a name. So I'm just going to call it backend. And I've already built this, so it went pretty fast. But you can see that it's tagged as backend latest. Um, the thing that's after the colon is sort of the tag or the version number. So this is just the latest of the backend image. And then if I wanted to run this, I could do so like this. Docker run rm. I'm going to give it a name. rm, by the way, means remove when done. It's something you pretty much need to do when you have a name. Uh, there's kind of no reason to use it. Uh, habitually, no reason not to use it habitually. So Docker run RM, backend, backend, cool. Now it says that it's listening on port 80, and we're already talking about communication, so I jumped the gun a little bit here. Let's notice that our logs are working. So right away we get console logging here, so diagnostics is kind of checked off. We were doing logging before, we still have logging now. Uh, some of the things that are different here is the development environment is production. And the uh, listening address is port 80, which is something that the ASP.NET Core base image will do. So because we're using the ASP.NET Core base image, we end up listening on port 80. So that's kind of cool. Let's check this out and see if we can, can we get to the application on port 80? And no, we can't. And so the reason why we can't connect to the application on port 80 is, well, the container is listening on port 80, but it's not bound to port 80 on my machine. It's only bound to port 80 in the container. And we said that the networking environment of containers is isolated. So what we have to do instead, if we want to be able to interact with this, is we have to map a port. And it's very easy to forget which direction they go. Um, but generally, how you should sort of think about this is the local port first, and then the container port second. So we're going to expose port 5000 mapped to port 80 for our backend service. And then that's running again. And let's hit port 80. Or let's put port 5000. And we're working. So we were able to talk to it. So a couple things that are different right off the bat about Docker networking environment. Because you are isolated, you can listen on whatever port you want. Um, because it's not really possible for you to conflict with anything except for yourself. Second of all, because of that, if you want to be able to communicate with that container, you have to expose it onto the host system in some sort of way to be able to access it. Now let's dig in a little bit more to what's in this container because we know that it's this isolated kind of thing and so on. But let's take a look at it. So I'm going to do a Docker exec and I'll use backend because that was the name of the container that we started. And the command that I'm going to run is bash. I'm going to run a command inside the container. And then because I want this to be interactive, I'll do dash IT, which basically gives me a terminal. So here I'm inside the terminal. Who am I? I'm root. Uh, what's my working directory? My working directory is app. And what do I have? LS. So here is all of my publish output. My publish output, including the backend uh, exe and backend dll, is there. And I can actually open a terminal into this image, and I can browse the files or run other sort of user mode commands inside this container if I want to see what's going on. Now, if I wanted to find these files on my own machine, where are they? I don't know. They're in some temp directory that's managed by Docker. I don't have to deal with where these files came from or where they ended up on my machine. So if you imagine that this, um, you imagine that this backend image was something I didn't write, something I got from the internet. I don't have to download the files and store them somewhere to use it. They just exist in the container, which is pretty cool when we think about the deployment concerns. Um, Docker images, because they can be distributed with registries and distributed over the internet, can solve one of our deployment concerns of just, well, 
do I have to deal with file management? Do I have to manage that kind of stuff? No, you don't. So let's get our two let's get our two services working together and let's get our two services talking to each other. So I'm going to show you something that is not going to work and I'm not going to bother I'm not going to bother actually running it. I'll just show you something that's not going to work. So here in my front end directory, I can say run front end. It actually doesn't matter what directory I'm in because um, these are just images that I've already built. Um, so let's say I wanted to do 5001 for port 80 for the front end. And then I have to pass the name of the image. There's a couple things that I need, remember. We need the front end to be able to talk to the back end. So I have to provide some way for the front end to be able to talk to the back end. And then um, those two things have to be able to communicate. Well, what Docker doesn't do by default, I have to configure it, I have to tell it to do this, is if I want to have host names for these two things to communicate with each other, because remember, they're isolated, I have to have some way to route. I can't just say localhost. If I want to provide uh, host names for these to be able to choose between each other and find each other, provide addresses that are routable, I have to put them on a network together. So I have to say, I want these two things to be on the network. And it has to be a network that I create or else I don't get those host names. I don't get those DNS entries. So for instance, I could say this services, this is passing an environment variable, by the way. I could say services backend equals HTTP backend, but I haven't actually mapped this backend container to this host name. So that's not going to work. So I've actually already created a network. And you can think of networks as these sort of like grouping constructs. I've already created this really cool network called my network. And so in order to run this command with a network, you can say docker run rm name front end, because this is the front end network, my cool network. Oh, there's another hyphen there. And then I need that environment variable so that I can map between them. So we'll say services double underscore equals HTTP backend. And then I need to map a port so that I can actually talk to the dang thing. And then front end. This is going to be embarrassing if I didn't get it right. Okay, so I think I got it right. I got the URL, which I wanted. I'm listening on port 80. The app is running. And then the only other thing I have to do is I have to restart this guy on that network. Now, I've cheated a little bit here by specifying a name already. And the thing is that the name is the one that's going to make these have host names. So the fact that I've given them names is what makes them show up on this network. So now I've got both of these guys on the same network. Let's hit this real quick and see if it works. So 5000 is my back end. That works. And then let's try 5001. That works. And you can see that they've got, um, you can see that they've got slightly different values than before. Like these, these have generated host names for each other and they have different IP addresses that they're on and so on. And these are all sort of implementation details of how Docker networking works on our computer. From a networking point of view, these things really are isolated from each other, which is kind of cool. But you remember that a lot of setup needed to take place in order to get this to work. There was a lot of like, a lot of work went into specifying all these details and getting all these command line arguments. So it's really helpful to have that understanding of what I need, what my requirements are. I need this thing to talk to this thing. Well, then cool, they have to be on the same network, right? If you want to have them both have addresses and both be on the same network or both be able to talk to each other, then you want them to be on the same network. So you can see that that level of clarity about what we're trying to accomplish can come in handy. Now, we haven't talked about Docker files quite yet, and they're a subject, I think, of much consternation for a lot of people. And this is squarely in that deployment concern of how we build applications and work in cloud environments. So I think I owe it to you to run through Docker, Docker files and Docker a little bit. This isn't going to be a full tutorial. It's kind of my opinion of uh, what goes in here. So this is a Docker file from backend. 
And I literally copied this from uh, Docker's website. So I literally just copied this from Docker's website. And the only thing that you have to modify is this entry point. What is the name of the DLL that is coming in here? And just get a feel, just get a feel for what this looks like if you haven't seen this before. And I want to highlight a couple things. So first of all, you notice that there's two, think of this as having two sections, right? This top section is where we do the build. And this bottom section is where we actually run the code. So two-phase build in Docker basically means I use Docker to do my build and then I take the results of that build and I put them in another image and then that's the image that actually runs. So up here is where I do my build. It's a .NET publish like we talked about before. And then this bottom part is where I do my run. So that's cool. It's a two-phase build. Um, there are various reasons why people want a two-phase build or choose to do a two-phase build. Um, you could also just not do a two-phase build. Um, you could do something like write a script that publishes your application to disk and then copy those files into the Docker file and do things that way, for instance. Um, some people like it this way, some people like it the other way. Um, the other thing that I want to highlight here is these these from statements. And from statements are what we mean when we talk about a base image. So the build image is pretty big because it's got the .NET Core SDK. Um, the, the amount of stuff you need to build an application is way bigger than the amount of stuff you need to run an application, which makes sense. You have to have the compilers and all the libraries, even the ones you're not using. This other from statement here uses the ASP.NET image and specifically the 3.1 image, which matches the version of the runtime that I'm using, which seems like a pretty good choice. Uh, this is going to be a lot smaller because it just has the stuff that you need. And you can see that the main, the main sort of thing that we do in this run image is copy the files we need and then specify a command line. So it doesn't really feel other than the fact that it's happening in two phases, it doesn't really feel like things we're unfamiliar with, and it doesn't really feel like um, doesn't really feel like something fundamentally different from running a process or doing a publish and then running the process. The other thing that I would highlight here is to do with how Docker works. Basically, Docker is broken up into a series of layers. And um, the best way to explain without getting into a lot of detail is basically say, you benefit tremendously when you're building Docker images from doing things in steps from least likely to change to most likely to change. So what this does doing is it's doing the restore before it's doing a publish with the idea being that, well, the set of dependencies of the application are not going to change that much. And most importantly, they change when the CS proj changes. So what the Docker system can do is it can cache that layer and say, well, if your CS proj hasn't changed, I don't need to run restore again. Um, whereas the code in your application is more likely to change. So if the code in your application changes, then you need to run a publish again. But without getting too much into the details, that's kind of the gist of how this works as a two-phase build. The other thing that I would show you about this that's kind of cool is Docker has features around versioning and deployment and things like that. So you could say docker build dot and dot says basically use this directory. Uh, and then T is how you give it a name. And you could say something like rynowak backend. So my username, my image name. And then, you know, if this is version... 1.0.0 of my application, I could give it a version number or something like that. And then I could refer to it explicitly by this version number somewhere else. So Docker has various tools for versioning that you can use to, in your deployment strategies, to make sure that you're getting exactly what you want. Um, the other thing is registries. So you could say Docker push and specify what you want to push here. And this could go to some server somewhere, maybe Docker Hub, which is public, or maybe some server that's part of your organization where you store images or something that you use for development. So you can move these images around and copy them around, which give you a tremendous amount of flexibility with how you deploy stuff. And that's it for this demo, and we'll, we'll recap a little bit. So what we found using containers is that a few new capabilities were added. Due to their isolated nature, the host can assign host names to each container and can also give each container its own host name to avoid port conflicts. Additionally, we can package whatever dependencies we want in an image 
so we don't have to worry about what's installed on the machine where it's running. And since a container ultimately launches a process, we keep all the capabilities that we had before. One of the biggest benefits of a container is that with registries and versioning, we now have a robust system for managing catalog of images. It starts to feel like something we can use naturally as part of a CI-CD pipeline or another kind of automated deployment system. But what's not so great is maintaining those Docker files. We end up copy pasting a lot because so much of a Docker file is boilerplate. If they aren't part of the development flow, then they can easily bit rot. Additionally, Docker files fight with the way we build .NET code in a lot of cases. You need to manage the set of files you, need, you copy into Docker when doing a build. But as .NET developers, we really like to have multi-project services or dependencies on, on files outside the project's direct directory like a NuGet config. Here's some of my advice to simplify it if you find this difficult. I know there's a lot of opinions about how to containerize things properly or um, what's the best thing to do. And it's not necessarily all wrong or any of it's wrong. It's that you can optimize for different things with how you containerize. A lot of users seem to really like the two-phase build technique that's popular for native code compiled languages. I'd encourage you to think about what if you're really getting a lot out of it. Um, if you build one service per repo, things can be really simple. Use the repo root as a Docker context and copy everything in. This can be really flexible and gives you pretty much any option you want to take after that for how to build the images. I always like to highlight this recipe because it gets you out of manually managing files and it can be really flexible and straightforward to do. If you build multiple services from the same repo, consider whether you should abandon the idea of two-phase builds. You can write a script to do a publish on one project and then build the image from the output without ever creating a Docker file. You could even do a hybrid where you maintain Docker files for the projects where you care about customizing what goes in them and just use a script to build the image without a Docker file uh, as a sort of general case thing. So you may have something you may have noticed so far is that all the technologies we looked at really only do one thing at a time. And yes, we're using a very simple application as the example so far because we have to manage every service separately. But we haven't looked at any technologies that really allow us to automate multiple services at a time or have any sort of relationships between them other than the ones that we create on our own. Now we'll look at a more sophisticated app and some technologies that can do more than one thing at a time. So here's our bigger app. It's got three websites, a Redis instance, and a Postgres database. It's a simple voting application where you can vote for whether you like dogs or cats better and see the results update in real time. Uh, the basic flow is that you use the voting app to make your vote. That will push an entry into Redis, which will then be read by the worker. The worker will update a entry in a database and the results application will get the uh, updated results broadcasted to it with SignalR. So let's use our systematic approach to plan this application. First, what does each service need? Well, these are ASP.NET Core applications using 3.1, so we need that, same as before. And there's a lot more communication happening here. Our code will communicate over HTTP, but we also need to connect to Redis and Postgres. And like before, we want to inject the URLs and connection strings using config. So our voting app and our results app needs to be visible externally. They need to be accessible to users. And uh, the results app needs to be able to talk directly to the worker app, but that's kind of an internal detail of the application. So all three web apps need to listen on HTTP. Two of them are for users. One of them is for a service. For the runtime, We'll be using Docker apps, which was renamed from Docker Compose. And it's a way to organize multiple containers, run them, and manage them as part of the same unit. In terms of deployment, it can deploy containers. It can also deploy our Redis and Postgres instances as containers. For communication, like we saw in the last demo, we'll automatically get a host name to use to refer to each service. And we will need to manually choose ports for anything we want to expose externally. I also want to highlight here that Docker provides a capability for managing secrets separately from the standard features for config. This is meaningful because in a production app, we'd likely use a cloud-hosted database, and we want to secure access to the connection string. 
For local development purposes, we're going to be using Docker images for both Redis and Postgres and running them locally. And so using configuration in Docker Compose will be productive and easy. And we're not exposing any credentials to any real data store. But keep in mind that if you're when once you're talking about real databases, you actually care about securing those credentials. And lastly, let's map our requirements onto the platform features. We can use the ASP.NET Core base image to provide our dependencies. Uh, we'll use separate images for Redis and Postgres for development purposes. We'll rely on the Docker assigned host names for each service so that they can communicate with each other internally. And we'll use port 80, the default, for our web applications. Additionally, we'll have to map external ports for ourselves to be able to communicate with the voting app and the results app. And we'll use environment variables to pass in our connection strings and service URLs. So let's take a look. We're back. Um, this will be a demo of our voting application using Docker Compose to express our application model and how this fits into the framework that we're using. So this is Docker Compose if you haven't seen it. Um, the, the actual product behind it has been renamed to Docker Apps, but I think Docker Compose still works as the file name. And you might notice with this Docker Compose file that first of all, this is our first like more than one at a time kind of application model. It actually assumes that you have a set of services that your application is composed of, which I think is a really good fit for how we do microservices development. So how this sort of fits is you list each service here, and then you get a little YAML blob. So these are just names, they're free. You get a little YAML blob for each service that sort of describes what to do with it. And again, we're gonna look at this through the same lens we've been looking at things before. Um, deployment, configuration, communication, and diagnostics. So first of all, let's get first two out of the way. Um, I'm using a Redis image and a Postgres image in development. Um, and these are just images. So when you specify the image tag here, it's just gonna go get that Docker image and use it from uh, whatever registry is specified. That doesn't stop you from being able to configure it just because you didn't build the code. And in fact, what I'm doing is injecting a password into Postgres. Now, the fact that I'm injecting a password here in this config means that I have control over that password and therefore I know what it is. So I've got my Redis and my Postgres instance, which are both leaf nodes. Now let's talk about my code. So we'll start with the vote service. Now the vote service needs to connect to Redis and it's going to use Redis to communicate um, sort of remotely with the worker service. So a couple things, deployment. So you can tell Docker Compose to build things for you. And so in this case, I've specified the context, which could either be a directory with a Docker file or URL or something. So I've said, my context is the vote directory relative to this file. And in the vote directory, I have already created a Docker file next to all of my code. So it's gonna build an image um, tag it and name it appropriately based on what I've put here and then use that to run this service. Uh, lastly, I, or next, I'm mapping a port because the vote service is something that is user-facing. So as we learned in the last demo, um, ASP.NET Core in the Docker, in the ASP.NET Core base image will listen on port 80. So we're gonna listen on port 80, but I wanna expose that on localhost as port 5000 so that I can talk to it and I can browse that website. Next, uh, I need to inject a connection string to Redis. So something that I want to show off a little bit here, um, maybe the maybe the worker is the best place to use it, but um, I am using a library from the Thai project. And so this library from the Thai project really ends up looking just like, um, this, this really functions just like how we've been using config in other ways. So I can specify in my Docker Compose, connection strings colon or connection strings double underscore name of the service and I have a handy dandy uh, method that I can use to extract that and at the end of the day it's all just config let me see if I can find it yeah it's right here configuration dot get configuration strings so this is a method um, that's provided by that tie package Ultimately, it's just mapping to that configuration key. So now that you've got a solid foundation of how these configuration keys work, you can use that library if you like it, or you can make your own convention and your own helper library for it. it really doesn't matter. Just choose something that you like. Um, 
And then the other thing that I'm doing here that is a little bit specific to Docker Compose is I'm doing a depends on. And you don't have to do this, and you might even want to avoid it in a lot of cases. Depends on is me saying, first of all, I'm expressing a dependency, which is a good piece of high-level information to capture. What it means in the Docker Compose sense is that it will not start the voting service until the Redis service has started, which is a good way to avoid logging error messages and stuff like that on development. Um, there's no sense in starting something when it can't be used. Um, you might not want to use the dependency, the depends on tag, because in reality, in, in real you know cloud environments and distributed systems, the idea that you can strictly order dependencies is maybe not always true, because um, your dependencies could go away at any point. Redis instance could die at some point and so on. So you really do really want to be resilient, but I'm using it here. Um, so looking through some of these other services, let's just see if we can notice anything different. So I've got a connection string for Redis and Postgres because that's what my worker needs to talk to. Um, other people will talk to my worker. And so uh, the results page actually does talk directly to the worker. And you can see that I've mapped in the host name and the port of my worker into this result service um, so that I can use those again with those tie extension methods. Now what's the trade-off on doing this versus just hard coding it? Because I do expect to see the host name worker and I do expect to see the port number 80. What's the trade-off with hard coding it? Well, testability maybe. Um, the ability to the ability to depend on an environment that has host names versus an environment that doesn't. So Docker and Docker Compose, for instance, can provide host names for your services. Other environments you might want to run in, you might not have control over the host name, and so you might not want to hard code it. So I per, I think it's a much better deal to just make everything configurable, and then that relationship will be expressed in your configuration files and your manifests and those kind of things um, for use to see, because it really is an important detail and you don't want to let it totally fly under the surface. But what's cool about this, what's different about this is when I'm using Docker Compose, it will create a Docker network for me. So if you remember the previous demo that we did with Docker, I had to manually create a Docker uh, Docker network. I had to manually assign a host name and things like that to get this cross-service communication to work. Um, for your next project, if you're using Docker for development, maybe skip, skip running Docker at the command line and go right to Compose because it's a lot simpler. So I think that's about all there is to say to this. I think maybe the value and simplicity of this compared to the kinds of things that we need should be pretty apparent. Uh, I'll go ahead and run this. And the way that I do that is with Docker Compose up. And you can see that that will start all these services and I'll get all the spew of all the logs um, sort of tagged with what they're going what they're going to. And then over here I've got my two applications so I'll just tear this tag off so that we can put these two things side by side. And I will restart these because this is from me doing a dry run on the demo. So over here I've got my results, over here I've got my vote, and you can see I can vote and it will just switch back and forth because I'm the only person voting, um, which is pretty great. So, but anyway, you can see that this works. You can see that the communication's happening. If I come over here to the logs, you can see the logs flying by as stuff happens in these apps. So that's easy, pretty easy to make this work. And Docker Compose, when you've understood Docker and all these other things, it's maybe a little bit more convenient and faster to get working than some of these other things. Now that we've gotten this far, we can comfortably make the jump to Kubernetes. We'll need a little bit of background on it to proceed. First of all, let's just say that Kubernetes is a much more complicated system than anything we've looked at so far. When we talk about something like Docker, it's simpler to configure because running a container is the main thing that Docker does. Kubernetes, on the other hand, supports many different types of objects, so running a container isn't really the main thing it does. You don't need to specify when you're configuring Docker Compose that you're configuring a container because container is the type of everything, but Kubernetes has a lot of different object types. Next, we're used to management of host names for containers automatically from Docker. In Kubernetes, not only is it not automatic, it's not even the same object. So that's new. Our services don't map one-to-one -to, -one to a single config entry in the application model of Kubernetes, more like one-to-two or more. The reason why services, or uh, 
routing, if you want to think of it that way, or DNS, if you want to think of it that way, and Kubernetes are separate objects, is that they're very powerful and have a lot more features um, because you can use them to refer to things that aren't your code. Lastly, the object format of Kubernetes is pretty complicated compared to what we've seen so far. The amount of concerns we have to express and how they are expressed is pretty much the same as our previous examples, but the volume of YAML produced is much larger because of all the features that we're not using. Before we do a demo, let's look at a brief diagram. I mentioned that we'd have a separate object to configure host names, so that's off to the right side. Other than that, there's another level of nesting here. Kubernetes layers even more features on top of the container. We have richer monitoring features like health checks and the ability to run multiple containers side by side within a single pod or even run a container as an initialization task. And that's without getting into some of the fancy deployment, rollout, uh, lifecycle kinds of things that Kubernetes can do as well. I'm omitting a lot of details here because I want to focus on what's most relevant to how we design and model our code and how you grow up from running a single process to understanding a system like Kubernetes. So let's do a demo. Now we're going to look at some Kubernetes resources and try to make comparisons with some of the other things we've seen um, and talk about them in terms of the same four capabilities we've been talking about. So this is Kubernetes YAML and I'm not going to actually deploy or run anything here um, because it would just be the same demo you've seen before. But I've converted one of these services, the result service in this case, to the Kubernetes YAML format. So uh, like we talked about, there are two resources here, two objects here. There's a service and a deployment. And the deployment represents something that's going to be deployed and run. And the service represents uh, sort of a routing entry or DNS entry, just a networking entity for configuring DNS. And the reason why this is important, oops, that shouldn't be there. And the reason why this is important is that we are really kind of have covered many of the concepts that are surfaced at the application level at this point. And these different formats and different models sort of remix these concepts in different ways. So we saw in Docker and Docker Compose that you could assign host names to your application components and do routing based on DNS between them. Well, that's what this is. When we create a service called results, we bind the name results in the Kubernetes cluster in DNS to uh, to the port or to, to the IP addresses of whatever's run by this deployment. And I'll explain how that works in just a second. But we really accomplish the same sorts of tasks and have the same sorts of needs and are fulfilled in different ways or configured in slightly different ways in these environments. But they're not really too different if you kind of let your eyes lose focus a little bit. So I want to do a couple quick comparisons. So just focus on this part right here. Just this part right here. You can ignore the rest of the file for now. And then let's compare that to what's in Docker Compose right here. So it doesn't really look that different, does it? Because fundamentally, we're using these capabilities of images for deployment and environment variables for configuration and environment variables and configuration together to express relationships or communication between services that the, the commonality start to shake out. Things can work in similar ways in different systems. So what's different about Kubernetes? Well, for deployment, we just have images again, right? This is a container image, and it, Kubernetes deployments just operate on containers, so we're good to go. We've already learned about that. For communication, in order to expose a service, in order to listen to traffic, the thing to do is describe the port that you're listening on and then provide some kind of service for that port, uh, provide some sort of service for your container that will allow it to show up in DNS. Now, I've used this as a default service. I didn't specify a type on it, which means that it's just going to be internal to the cluster. There are lots of other techniques you could use if you wanted to expose external traffic that I'm not going to drill into as part of this demo. Now, the really tricky thing that you get exposed to when you look at this is how these selectors and labels and metadata things all relate to each other. And that's the sort of tricky thing that you got to go, go after here. So we'll zoom out and zoom out and zoom out. So this service says, 
the results service or the results DNS entry is on protocol TCP on port 80, which sounds about right for HTTP. And how does it bind to, how does it bind? How does it know what to route to? Well, that's what the selector does. And so these metadata label sections in Kubernetes are just ways of saying, um, here's a set of key value pairs that you can use to query on. And the, that querying is useful both for management experiences with the command line, like searching and filtering, but it's also useful for things like this service. So the fact that this deployment has labels app results here, and this service has selector app results here, means that these things are gonna be associated. Now, what's going on with the rest of this big complicated deployment thing? And the answer is it's a sort of a, not really a Kubernetes detail, but it's something that's important to understand about how things work in Kubernetes, is that a deployment is really a recipe. A deployment isn't really the thing that runs in Kubernetes. Pods are the things that run. So this deployment works like a template to create the pods that are gonna run. You can think about a deployment as like a manager for pods. So like one of the other things I can do here is I could say this is gonna have replicas, right, five. And so five pods are gonna be created from this template. And that's why there's all this complexity here is deployment really acts like a recipe for the other thing. It's just layers upon layers upon layers. Now you could instead write a pod and you could delete a lot of this complexity if you wanted to write a pod yourself. But it's not really a good practice to use a pod. Deployments are way more powerful. And so people tend to just use deployments for anything. So anyway, hopefully this makes the case that this stuff isn't really that scary to approach it. And that the same system of how to think about these kind of problems or how to think about application requirements can really scale up and down the gamut of how we approach these different cloud systems. Thanks for your attention. I'm going to wrap up some of the key points. Application models let us describe the interface between your software and a runtime environment. We can apply systematic thinking to help with both understanding and planning the needs of services, as well as how to configure a deployment. Think about your services requirements in terms of four categories, deployment, communication, configuration, and diagnostics. And then understand what options your platform provides for each of these concerns and then write down a mapping of your requirements into those configuration options. This should, this should result in whatever manifest you need to deploy. Applying these principles for ASP.NET Core applications doesn't take much work. First of all, understand what the framework provides for configuration, logging, and server features. Avoid hard coding URLs like uh, URLs or connection strings of other services and instead drive them with configuration. This will make things much easier for you in general and be more flexible to, to work in different deployment environments. And lastly, check out Glenn, Glenn Condren's talk at this conference on Project Tai to make multi-service development easier. As another note, there are another, top, there are another few topics I wanted to include in this talk but didn't really get to due to complexity and time. We only really got to look at logging as a diagnostics technology because every platform provides logging. When you look past this, you might extend the platform by collecting structured logs, distributed tracing, and metrics. These are key technologies that should be part of your design and development consideration. That's all for me. Thanks.